Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Soup Mobile Church, a one of a kind church on the entire planet. Because at Soup Mobile Church, the homeless are the members, and anyone else that walks in that door, they're your guest. Today's lesson is titled Balancing the Scales, Part 2. Balancing the Scales, Part 2. But first, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning and I ask you to open our hearts, open our minds, show us in your word the lessons, the learnings that you have for us. I thank you so much for your son Jesus Christ who came 2,000 years ago and hung on the cross that we would have life and have it more abundantly. I pray this all in his precious name. Amen. 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 Balancing the scales, part two. Today we're going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 36. If you're in your church Bible, it's already been bookmarked to page 1706. But if you're in your own Bible, go to Acts, chapter 9, verse 36. We've been talking about balancing the scales. The Bible says that we're all sinners and come short of the glory of God. That's each and every one of us, no exception except for the exception, Jesus. The only one without sin. The rest of us, we're dealing with sin all of our lives. But for most of us, we do more of our sinning in the first part of our lives than in the latter part. Now why is that? Why more sin in the first half than the latter part? Well, the reason is, for most of us, we're learning, we're growing, we're maturing. We're making mistakes in the earlier part of our lives and hopefully, with hindsight, we're learning from those mistakes. So by the time we get to the latter part of our lives, we've progressed far enough, matured enough, that we're willing to stop looking inwardly and start looking towards helping our fellow man. For most of us, the early part of our lives is the more selfish part of our lives. That's where we're more concerned about ourselves, our careers, our families, uh, building up money for retirement, whatever it is. The early years are more about ourselves. But the latter years, if you learn from your mistakes and learn from the hindsight and learn from the lessons that God brings you, the latter years are the years that you start to balance your scales. Now, this balancing the scales, why do we want to balance our scales? Well, someday we're going to stand before the Lord and have to give an accounting. Now, balancing your scales, the sin versus the good works, it doesn't affect your salvation. That salvation has been bought and paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago. Balancing your scales, the sin versus the good, that's something entirely different. We want to balance our scales so that someday, when we stand before the Lord, we're going to hear seven words, seven magic words. Those words, well done my good and faithful servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear. But to do that, I believe we need to balance our scales. We need to make up for the sin, the selfishness in the early part of our lives, in the latter part of our lives. So we're all balancing the scales. Now, we're not just trying to balance the scales to hear those seven words, well done, my good and faithful servant. We want to balance the scales to honor Christ. We want to honor the gift of the cross. What a gift it was. I mean, he gave it up all for us. He gave it up, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners. So it's not like we did some good stuff and we had no sin and Christ stepped forward for us. Mm -mm. We were sinners and he stepped up to the plate for us <coughs> and gave his own life. So we want to honor that gift and we honor it by trying to balance the books. We talked last week how Mr. Harbor and I went down to Houston after Hurricane Harvey and we spent a week there. We spent a week down there helping the flood victims and helping the regular homeless that are in Houston that were affected by the flood because they too were wiped, their homes were wiped out in the tent cities they were living in by the flooding. And we did a lot of things down there in Houston, a lot of, a lot of balancing the books for me and Mr. Harbor. We were feeding the homeless, we were feeding the flood victims, working with the Red Cross. We were providing shuttle service with our van. 
but one day, we were back working behind the docks at the convention center. This is where thousands of these flood families were being housed in this convention center. Thousands of cots, families, entire families that had gotten wiped out. But we were on the back docks, on the back docks moving flood supplies back and forth. Back on that back dock, there were no TV cameras. There were nobody saying, oh, you guys are the greatest thing since sliced bread. Thanks for coming from Dallas. Thanks for helping out. There was nobody. It was just me and Mr. Harbor on the back dock. So sometimes, when you're balancing the books, there's not going to be anybody there to see it. Nobody to pat you on the back and say, nice job. Good for you. Nice going. But God is always watching. He sees what you're doing behind the scenes. So sometimes when you're balancing your books and doing good things for your fellow man, just know it's going to be on the down low. Nobody's going to be seeing it, but God sees everything that you do to balance your books. There's a story in the Bible we're going to talk about today in the book of Acts, and we're going to talk about a lady. Her name is Dorcas, D-O-R-C-A-S. Now this is somebody you don't hear about in the Bible too much. She's in there, but she's got a smaller, smaller story than, say, a, a Peter or a Paul or a Moses. Uh, th this is a much smaller story, but it amplifies what we're talking about today and about balancing our books so that someday we can hear those simple words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Someday we're going to hear those by balancing our books. So Dorcas, let's talk about her, but before we get into the actual chapter in verse in Acts, let me give you the backstory. So when this story is happening with Dorcas, this young lady, what is happening, Jesus, just shortly before, has been crucified, resurrected from the dead, and ascended to heaven. And now he's gone. And it's the early days of the church, the Christian church. And these are some pretty tough times, the early days of the Christian church. And Peter, who we know as the number one disciple of Christ, Peter is really leading what's happening <coughs> after Jesus goes. And Peter has got some amazing power. He's healing people in the name of Jesus Christ. So Peter, he learned as a disciple. And we know Peter, he made some mistakes. We know that three times Peter denied Christ, even knowing him at the very end. So Peter made some mistakes, but Peter himself was balancing his own books. And now in the early times of the Christian church, when Jesus is gone, Peter steps up to the plate. He's actually healing people, helping spread the good word. And then we come to this young lady by the name of Dorcas. <coughs> so let's see where we are. We're in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 9. We're in verse 36. And it says, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping people. I want you to notice that word, always. The Bible doesn't say that some of the times Dorcas was doing good. It doesn't say once in a while. It doesn't say a lot of the time. It says always. And we know the Bible is very precise in the words that are used. So she's always helping other people and helping the poor. What is she doing? She's balancing her own, her own books because she's no different than any of us. Remember, in the early part of our lives, we're more selfish. We tend to do more sin. So she's a good person helping other people. But it says in the next verse, 37, about that time she became sick and died. And now, here's where Peter comes into the story. And this, this gets pretty good here. It says that Peter was in Lydia. And they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Now, remember, Dorcas is already dead. She's died. Peter's in a different town, but they send for him. Why are they sending for him? We're going to see in a, just a few moments why. It said Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken up stairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Now, this verse is pretty important. Dorcas made such an impact on the people in the community with her good works, such an impact that as she's laying dead, the people, the widows, are holding up the items that she had made. They're holding up the robes and other clothing that she had sewed and made for the poor. 
So her impact, while you might not think sewing clothes, helping the poor by giving them clothes, you might think it's a small thing, it was a huge thing back then. It was huge for them, it was so huge, she's dead, and they're holding up the clothes that she made for the poor. So this woman, even though in the Bible overall, she doesn't get much notice, she was making a big impact back in her time, and she's balancing her own books. So let's get back to Peter. Let's see what Peter does, because remember, he's balancing his, his scales too. It says, Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning to the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, also Dorcas, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for all the believers, especially the widows, remember the ones holding up the clothes, and presented her to them alive. So Peter had amazing power. Even though in his earlier life he had done some things that, that he regretted, and hindsight <coughs> wish he hadn't done, including the denying Jesus three times, here he is making up for it. He's doing great works. Now, when you're doing a good deed for your fellow man, God knows how to magnify it. Let's see how he does it here with Peter. It says in the next verse, after he's, he's brought her back from the dead, it said, this became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. So God used this story, this healing of somebody that Peter brought back from the dead, Dorcas. He used it not just to bring her back from the dead, but he used it to bring more people to him. It was a great example for all the believers there in the land of Joppa to see the power and the majesty and the might of the Lord as it was working through Peter. But remember, Peter, as great as he was, was doing just what I'm asking you to do. He was balancing his own scales, balancing the earlier sin with good works in the latter part of his life. Now, some people say to me, they say, Pastor, well, that's great for, for Peter, and that's great for you and Harbor that went to Houston, and that's great for Dorcas who made clothes for other people, but, but guess what? I have nothing to give. You ought to see my life, Pastor. It's in shambles. I can't help anybody else. I can't do any good works, but I would beg to differ. I would ask you to consider the possibility that even the smallest things can make a huge impact on other people's lives. For example, if you had a quarter, and you were walking down the street and you saw a parking meter about to expire and somebody was going to get a ticket, you could stick that simple quarter into that parking meter and save that person from a ticket. Now this is a person you probably never see, Nobody sees you doing it. You're not getting any credit for it. You're like on the back docks when Harbor and I are working at the convention center. But remember, God is watching. And that small act of kindness can save somebody a $40 ticket, which for them can make a big difference in their lives. You can help people with a kind word, just saying something nice to them. I told you this story that 25 years ago, when I was caregiving for my late wife, she had multiple sclerosis. When I was her primary caregiver, we were traveling around the country seeking medical treatment for her. And every Sunday, no matter what city we were in, we tried to go to church. But taking somebody that's disabled to church is not an easy task. So my emotional, my gas tank, being a caregiver, was run down. I was running out of gas. This strange church that we're in must have had 2,000 people. It was a huge church. After the service, as I'm getting my wife and I'm trying to get her back in the wheelchair, the pastor came up from nowhere. Now remember, I don't know him, he doesn't know me. He's a big, burly guy, about 6'3", just a huge guy. He comes up to me and he puts his arm around me and he gives me this bear hug squeeze and he says, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. Four words, out of nowhere. I remember how I felt when he did that. I felt such a sense of relief, such a sense of hope that somebody was telling me it was going to be okay and giving me a hug at the same time. It's 25 years have passed, and to this day, I remember not only what happened, but I remember how I felt. I remember the sense of relief I felt, the sense of hope I felt when he did that. Now, what did it take him to do it? Ten seconds. That was it. Never seen him since, he's never seen me. He went his path, I went my path. But a 10 second act 
has lasted more than a quarter of a century. Don't discount the power of small things. Don't discount the power of little short things that you can do to help your fellow man. Sometimes just a kind word, a word of encouragement. Don't discount the power of prayer. You can pray for other people, and the Bible, what does it say? The fervent, effectual prayers of a righteous man availeth much. You don't have to be doing big things. You don't have to be like the good Samaritan in the Bible that put the, the, the man that was robbed and beaten on his donkey and took him to the, to the inn and paid for it and banished him. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. It can be a small thing and make a big difference. There's a story. This is not a story from the Bible. This is a story titled, A Man He Needed a Son. This is a, tr a true story. The author is unknown. But I want to take a minute. Just take a minute and read the story to you and try to emphasize for you the importance of small things. Here's how it goes. It said, the nurse escorted a tired, anxious young man to the bedside of an elderly man. Your son is here, she whispered to the patient. She had to repeat the words several times before the patient eyes opened. He was heavily sedated because of the pain of his heart attack, and he dimly saw the young man standing outside the oxygen tent. He reached out his hand, and the young man tightly wrapped his fingers around it, squeezing a message of encouragement. The nurse brought a chair next to the bedside. All through the night, the young man sat holding the old man's hand and offering gentle words of hope. The dying man said nothing as he held tightly to his son. As dawn approached, the patient died. The nurse began to offer words of sympathy to the young man, but then he interrupted her. And he said, who was that man? The startled nurse said, I thought he was your father. He answered, no, I never saw him before in my life. She said, then why didn't you say something when I took you into him? He responded, I knew he needed his son, and his son just wasn't here. When I realized he was too sick to tell whether or not I was his son, I knew how much he needed me, and I said to a small thing. Here's a young man, a small thing. He didn't have to do it. He could have said to the nurse, that's not my fault. You know, I can't do that. A small thing. He sat with a dying man in his last hours. The man never knew it wasn't his son. What's the impact of that act of kindness? I would, I would say that's an impact that lasts an eternity. Small things. Look for ways that you can bless your fellow, your fellow man. Look for ways that you can balance your own scales. Look for ways that you can balance your scales so much that no matter what you've done in the early part of your life, no matter what sin, no matter how selfish your way you were, look for ways that you can balance your own scales. And then someday, when you stand before the Lord, you will hear those seven words. Well done, my good. Let's finish with prayer. Father God, Lord Jesus, we repent of our sins. Come into our hearts. We make you our Lord and Savior. Father, I pray a hedge of protection over every single person in this church. I pray you will guard them. You will guide them. You will keep them safe as they go about their day, about their week. I thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ, who came and hung on the cross and with his blood paid for our sins. I pray this all in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.